You're listening to the 40 Fit Radio Podcast, dedicated to the 40 plus community. Join us as we discuss the truth about fitness and health using science, reason, and the experiences of our host and content experts. Welcome to the 40 Fit Nation. Welcome back to the 40 Fit Radio and welcome back to the 40 Fit Nation. I'm your host, Coach D, and I'm also here with Coach Trent. Good morning. And it is a beautiful sunny day in Texas on a Tuesday morning at around 8.30 a.m. And man, it's going to be a great day today. Hope you're going to have a great day today out there, whether you're at work or you're enjoying some recreational time, whatever it is, hope you have a great day today. So today we're going to talk about... Strong shoulders again. This is the second uh, episode in a series of probably three, maybe four. And we're going to call this strong shoulder, but this is the injury episode. So this would be injuries. And this is the second part in our series, as I said. So today we're going to cover the basic injuries that occur in the shoulder uh, joint area. And um, what I see most commonly both in the clinic when I practice as a doctor of physical therapy and what I also see, what we also see in the gym from gym trainees and clients when they come in just for barbell training or fitness programming. So we're going to go through a general breakdown of, we've already done anatomy and physiology of the shoulder. We did that last visit in our last podcast. The one thing that we did not talk about that I wanted to cover real quickly, and we'll talk a little bit about today when it comes to injuries or pathologies, problems in the shoulder, and that's the bursa. And uh, the bursa sac, the bursa is an infolding of the shoulder joint inside the joint. There are some bursas that are extra articular outside the shoulder joint and some bursas that are inside um, in the shoulder joint. Uh, the bursa is completely extra articular and it's very broad and it is a large thin sac of bursal fluid, which basically acts as a protector between bones and contact pressure and things rubbing against the joint surface. And so it acts as a protective device, basically. Um, and then inside the joint, we talked about it. We've got the we've got the ligaments that encase the joint, like that rubber boot on a tie rod end. Mm-hmm. A terrible example, but I, it's it's what happens it when you're a semi gearhead. And so, um, and inside that rubber boot or inside that ligamentous uh, capsule, are is a lining of synovial cells, which produce synovial fluid, which is the lubricating joint of, I mean, the lubricating fluid of the joint. So um, we just wanted to throw that out there so you can know, because we're going to talk about bursitis today, and you need to know what the bursa sac is. So so we're going to start at the top with what I most commonly see in the clinic and gym as potential problems in the shoulder. And first of all, as we, again, Uh, breach the subject of anatomy and physiology. I want you to understand as a listening audience, when we look at any joint, we have a group of structures that are most commonly um, uh, involved. And this pretty much covers all of the structures that could be in any joint in the human body. So if you understand that that central principle transfers from the hip joint to the shoulder joint, to the knee joint, to the ankle joint, then you understand that those are the things that could be injured individually, or there could be two or three um, joint structures that have been injured or that you have problems with at the same time. And we want to look at those tissues. And so the first thing that we're going to talk about today would be the bones. And we talked a little bit about what bones are involved in the shoulder, but the bones themselves can be bruised. You can actually get a bone contusion. Let's say you were to land on the apex of the shoulder um, and land on it hard. The deltoid, the muscle around the joint would protect the shoulder to some extent, but you also might bruise the cortex, um, what we call the subchondral bone um, of the bone itself. So there's the bone that could be involved. Also, you could have um, a problem with like an arthritic bone or a bone that has a lot of spurring or calcific processes, what I call stalactites all over it. But we'll talk about problems in just a second. So the bone would be the first thing. The second thing would be the muscles. So the muscles could be involved in the injury. 
um, or in the problem in the shoulder joint. The third thing would be the tendons. And remember that tendons are structures that will connect the muscle to the bone. Okay. So the tendon could be involved and we could have a tendon tear. We could have just tendonitis. We could have a tendon rupture where it's torn in half. And actually within tendons themselves, we have a a progressional disease process that can occur. We call it tendonitis, okay, then tendinosis, and then tendinopathy. And that basically means an inflamed tendon um, that may not have any tears, in it. it's just inflamed. And then we have tendinosis, tendinosis, which basically we get kind of um, some changes in the structural elements of the tendon. It becomes less elastic, more plastic, more prone to tearing and and more calcific in its nature some scar cells in there and then the last would be tendinopathy there's an actual tear or damage to the tendon and then within tears we have several different grades all the way from a grade one to a grade two grade three and then rupture of the tendon so tendons would also be involved potentially yeah that's good uh yeah because you see uh you see the terms tendonitis tendinosis tendinopathy thrown around pretty freely um, but there's, so it represents an actual progression yes, of, yeah. uh, of a deterioration. Can you, once, once you have developed tendinosis, can it be reversed? Can you reverse some of those, those, uh, structural changes that have occurred? No, you can't necessarily reverse the damage that's been done to the tendon, but you can make the tendon functionally healthy enough to uh, be able to use it. So, um, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna turn back the hands of time. So, yeah. Um, and as we age to some of those tendons naturally over, over long periods of wear and tear um, uh, become, you know, more um, of a problem uh, just because of use and overuse. And actually um, that brings up a great point, Trent. I'm gonna do a, we're gonna do a podcast coming up soon on nothing but uh, the myths of tendonitis. Um, I read a, a couple of great or recent articles on tendonitis within the professional literature. And it just got me thinking more and more about how to treat tendonitis and what, you know, even I as a, as a DPT have thought would be the best way to treat it. And we've used various methods and over the years, and that has evolved over the years of my practice. But um, we're going to talk about that. I think that's going to be a great episode because it'll help people better understand uh, what they really need to do with any tendonitis of the human body, you know, whether right. you know, tendons a tendon, there's different types of tendons in the body, but, but they're basically the same. Yeah. So, so I think when we talk about injuries in general and certainly holds true with the shoulder is, uh, you know, tendonitis is one of the most common issues that people encounter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whether it be overuse or an actual strain or tear or, you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah. They're real common. So, um, so the next thing that could be, uh, potentially involved, uh, would be the vascular structures and that would be the arteries, and the veins that um, basically feed blood supply to that joint, the surrounding musculature and the surrounding tissues. So you could have an arterial or venous problem, a lack of circulation or damage. Uh, in the hip joint, there's a condition in the hip joint called legs perthes disease. And young males generally um, get this condition uh, more often than females do uh, when they're very young, like the age of 10 to 12. That's when the most common, common diagnosis time frame in. And it's basically a, where there is a avascular necrosis. There's a lack of blood supply to the femoral head and the femoral head begins to become necrotic or die uh, also with the surrounding cartilage. So they get, they get a limp, they get what's called a Trendelenburg limp, which is a lateral limp, and that's the classic sign of a leg perthes uh, diseased client. And so that's a good example of when there's an arterial damage, because uh, there's a genicular artery, there's an artery that runs out of the hip, uh, out of the pelvis and goes directly to the head of the femur, and that artery creates uh, carries most of the blood supply to the femoral head. And what happens is that artery gets damaged or disrupted and the, and the femur just dies um, or the, the head of the femur just will die or become damaged. So the veins and arteries are important too. So we've got muscle, bone, tendon, and then veins and arteries. And then we also have ligaments. And remember that ligaments connect bone to bone and they are non-contractile. They don't contract. Ligaments connect bone to bone and those are tissues that basically kind of hold the joint together and encase it. So you could have a ligament, a ligamentous sprain or um, a ligamentitis, which would basically be just an inflamed ligament. But ligaments have 
very uh, poor blood supply, if any, and very poor um, uh, nervous supply, nervous innervation. So that basically means that you don't feel them really very much, and they don't really create as big of a problem as unless you rupture them, as do say tendons and and the the basic principle here is that um, any structure that has more nerves connected to it and more arteries and veins connected to it, you notice more often. <laughs> it hurts more. And so uh, that's because you can feel it and because it has blood supply. And so tissues like ligaments, you you don't feel as often as a problem because they just don't have as much nerves and artery supply. Yeah. So It's kind of like when I was a kid, you know, I'd fall and scrape my knee and I'd complain. And yeah, my, the skin my, has a ton of nerve endings. My, my dad would... Uh, He'd, he'd, you know, lightheartedly punch me in the arm, but of course that hurt pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, yeah. does your knee hurt anymore? Yeah. Exactly. You know, it actually doesn't. It's, <laughs> I use that treatment method all the time with patients. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> hey, does this hurt? Great. We're going to do this. You're going to be so sore. You won't be able to walk. Yeah. Um, and then you won't complain about your back anymore. No, I'm That's just joking. Uh, or maybe not. But, um, but basically, you know, it's important to recognize these different tissues in the joints and, and they're pretty much globally the same from joint to joint to joint. I mean, you have similar structures or the same structures in every joint. The next thing would be, um, we talked about, let's see, we talked about ligament, tendon, bone, muscle. Uh, the next thing would be nerves and the nerves are obviously what feed the joint and your brain information about the joint, everything from pain to sensation or sensory, which in, would include pressure and proprioception, and then also to motor function, which would be firing the muscles around that joint so that that joint can move um, because the muscles are what move the joint. So the nerves could be involved too. So you could have what's called a peripheral neuropathy where you have a nerve palsy or a damage to the nerve and that could cause a dysfunction in how the shoulder moves. So um, that those could be involved too. Um, Think about Peyton Manning's neck. Yeah. In the last yeah. couple of years of his career. Yeah. Yeah. And there've been a lot of high end athletes that have had um, significant nerve palsies or nerve damage. And that has ended their career just because, yeah, there's not much that can be done with them because the nervous system, we don't know as much about how to heal the nervous system and really time and rest and then appropriate exercise and sometimes a proper diet and other things can be done, but, but, uh, and some medications, but, um, but nervous nerve damage is, um, is hard to, hard to recover from a lot of times, especially if you have a severance, a, a complete severance of a nerve. Um, it could be, it could be a career ending or, or, a uh, you know, lifting in, ending injury, um, if it creates enough dysfunction. So those are, those are bad things and they don't happen often. Um, not as often as, as the other elements. Um, and then you would also have, um, the joint cartilage, and the bursa we talked about earlier, but you would also have both the joint cartilage, what we call hyaline cartilage and articular cartilage. Um, hyaline cartilage is different than articular cartilage. Articular cartilage, um, uh, they're, they're two, two very similar types of cartilage, but one serves one purpose and one serves another. So, um, but the cartilages of the joint can be damaged and the cartilages of the joint basically serve to cover the bone uh, surfaces. And so they protect the bone from being bone on bone, which is very painful. You know, anybody has bad osteoarthritis or, or gout or arthritis in the knees or shoulders, man, that is extremely painful because once you get through the cartilage, which is very avascular and aneural, meaning it doesn't have uh, very much blood supply and it doesn't have very much nervous innervation, then uh, once you get through that, you get to the subchondral bone and it does have a lot of blood supply and it does have a lot of nervous innervation and that becomes very painful. So you could also involve the cartilage. Um, and then lastly, you could involve like the skin and the lymphatic vessels. Lymphatic vessels are basically the, the pipes in your body that help to carry waste back up away from an injury, clean out the injury and get all the trash out of it. Uh, after injury or exercise or anything else, the lymphatic tubules basically pick it up. And, um, and then you would also have the skin, which obviously the covering of your body. So it's very important. The integumentary system is very important to protect the joint. Um, and some conditions that affect skin like psoriasis uh, also create things like uh, psoriatic arthritis and um, can be a other pro can be problems in the joint too. So yeah. those are things to look for signs to look for. Um, 
So we talked about all the basic tissues. So we have muscles, we have bones, muscles, tendons, ligaments, nerves, arteries and veins, and then uh, bursas, and then also, um, last but not least, the lymphatic vessels and the skin, So and the cartilage too. So those are the tissues that could be involved in the shoulder. So let's talk about some common uh, diagnoses or problems in the shoulder that you as a listening audience might be experiencing or have experienced. I've had a couple of these in my shoulders over the years. Um, but there are some common diagnoses, and the first one would be basically just a sprain or a strain of a muscle group. Um, a sprain or a strain of a muscle, uh, and really we would call the, really, let, let, me, let me just give you some terminology here to be exact. Um, a strain is the word that we normally use, the nomenclature that we use for muscle involvement, and a sprain is what we normally use for um, tendon or ligament involvement, and really mostly ligament involvement. So just a rule of thumb there. So we would say a strain of the muscle. Now there are different grades of strains. It's grade one, grade two, grade three, and then the rupture of the muscle. So you could just have a minor strain of the muscle, a moderate or a more maximal strain of the muscle, and that's gonna determine the healing time frame. But in general, most strains of muscles will self-heal, and you can continue to lift with many times, um, or you can continue to do your, your fitness programming, uh, whatever you're doing, um, as long as pain doesn't cause significantly poor motion, um, and you can actually perform the activity or sport that you're doing. Um, and that should heal somewhere between 14 to 21 days. And at the outset, maybe a really bad strain or sport. A bad strain could take, you know, six to eight weeks to heal well, and you would be gradually progressively loading that over time. Now, let's talk a little bit about what's happening in the tissue with a strain. Um, and let's talk about maybe a grade one strain. So, yeah. y you know, you feel a little tweak after racking a set of presses, let's say. Um, if that's a muscle strain, does a strain indicate any actual damage to the muscle tissue? Not no. like a tear. No, like not a grade muscle one. Muscle tear. No. Okay. Well, I mean, a grade one, you could say zero to twenty-five percent of the fibers, but really, what you're no, what you're really talking about is an overstretch of the tissue. There's an overstretch of the tissue. There is damage done, but not to a structural level where you can't load it. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so you could use it immediately. In fact, the same day or the next day, definitely continue to load it. So do you clinically, do you differentiate between a strain and a muscle tear? No, uh, other than um, if it's bad enough to cause a very significant hematoma or a lot of blood bleeding in the area, then that tells me that most likely there was a significant uh, damage to the muscle tissue or tear to the tissue. And at that point, if there's a, if there is a, uh, if there's an alteration in function, in other words, they cannot perform the motion, i.e. because it's painful or because they just can't perform the motion anymore, then that's something that I start to look at with more cause for concern because, um, I mean, a good example would be if someone ruptures the musculotendinous junction of their calf, their Achilles, they can no longer plantar flex the foot. Um, that's a problem. That's right. not going to heal on its own. That's yeah. going to require surgical intervention, surgical repair, reconstruction. So, I mean, as a, as a therapist, what I do, when I see them in the clinic, they've usually already been diagnosed by a physician, hopefully so, um, and accurately so. Uh, and then when they come to see me as a patient, then I will look at the medical history. I'll look at the date of the injury, where they are today, what their subjective report is, and then what their function is. And any diagnostic reports like an MRI, CT scan, myelogram, whatever, the you know, bone scans, x-rays, whatever, the tissue is. And then I'll make a judgment call as to how I'm going to rehab that person. And many times the physician will set some boundaries on that. But, you know, I've been practicing so long that I, I really use my own professional um, experience as to how quickly I'm going to load them and what we're going to do. But, but in most of the cases, if it's a strain of the muscle, training can continue to move forward. And should continue to move forward. Um, but um, a lot of people, what happens is it's, it's painful. And so they don't want to train through that. But sometimes we need to. And sometimes we don't. And so it's, it's, it's not a, you know, A plus B does not always equal C, you know. <laughs> right, right. Um, 
Yeah, so that I mean, I, I think uh, those of us familiar with starting strength, we're familiar with the Bill Stars rehab protocol, which uh, is indicated for um, muscle belly tears or strains. Sure. And that involves doing a lot of high rep work as soon as possible following the injury. Right. right. So there. Right. Yeah. And there's and there's several modifications to that. I know. Um, Will Morris, who's a DPT in the military, the Army, um, he and I have talked, and we've also been on you know, our, our social Slack channel in our injury section talking to my coaches about how you know, maybe like he likes to load heavier earlier with lower sets, lower rep uh, sets. Um, and I like to kind of be in the middle. I like to be with um, a moderate load that's comfortable um, with, rep, with a rep range of maybe around 15-ish or so. I've kind of come down from the 20 rep range. Um, so I'm kind of in the middle there. But yeah. the goal is increasing the muscle belly's um, uh, nutrition, a lot of blood flow to it, getting the waste out of the muscle, and, uh, and getting the body to produce those good hormones in the muscle for healing. Um, and the good um, uh, anti-inflammatory cells that need to be delivered to the area and load it, you know, force the muscle to heal. But, but then again, I say that with some caution, you know, if you rupture a muscle in half, that's not going to heal. <laughs> yeah, and, if, you, and if your bicep rolls up like that, a lampshade. You're, then, uh, you can do curls all you want to and that's it's right. not happening. <laughs> <laughs> the curl may not happen. But um, yeah, so um, strains and sprains. A good example of that would be a deltoid strain or a rotator cuff strain. You could actually strain one of the rotator cuff muscles, one of the four, a bicep muscle strain down in the mid forearm area, a tricep strain, a rhomboid strain back by the shoulder blade or a trap strain. A bad trap strain can impair shoulder function just, just as much as these other ones can because the trap, especially the upper trap or middle trap, it can't elevate or adduct the shoulder blade the way it's supposed to and then it, the shoulder doesn't move right. So a strain would be the first thing that um, could, could uh, be a problem in the shoulder joint, a muscle strain. The second thing could be a sprain. Um, and that would be more involving the ligaments of the shoulder. Let's say you kind of fell on the shoulder real quickly and your shoulder kind of subluxed and it kind of, bump, bump, you know, kind of went a little bit out of socket and back in, not a full dislocation. And that could cause a ligament sprain. Um, also, what if you landed on the shoulder or had a plate or a bar land on something land on the shoulder and hit your AC joint? Well, it could, it could inflame the ligaments of the AC joint in front where the clavicle attaches to the, the shoulder blade. Um, uh, the transverse humeral ligament, which hold the, holds the bicep in place, could be sprained uh, as the long head and the short head goes up to the uh, humerus. It could, it could be sprained and could cause kind of a, actually kind of a dislocating tendon too, or subluxing tendon, bicep tendon. So there are several ligaments in the shoulder joint, the most common being the capsule, the ligaments that hold the shoulder joint together. And you could um, sprain those ligaments or the AC joint ligaments. And that generally takes about six to eight weeks to heal. And we want to be cautious with loading, especially if there's also laxity, looseness in the ligament. We want to limit the load on that early because loading those ligaments early doesn't necessarily make them stronger if they're already loose and they need to kind of, they need to kind of rest a little bit. So can we draw a general, um, observation that the more going back to your point about the more vascular the more innervated the tissue yeah. is the more responsive it is to loading is that fair to say um i would say the more responsive it is to adaptive change in regards to what we can do to make it better sure okay um, yeah, so yeah. you know the more we exercise it the stronger it will get the thicker we get ligaments get thicker just by the nature of loading them um, but when they're, when they've had trauma to them and they're already stretched out and inflamed, it's not a good time to be doing that until they ha can, um, kind of scar back down because you're relying on kind of a scarring process to heal those tissues. Um, not a, you know, an, I would say an abnormal process. It's not an abnormal process, but it's just not, it's not a, it's not a, um, uh, repair process. It's kind of a patchwork Process. Sure, sure. It's a little different, a little different in how it heals and the types of collagen cells that go in there and heal that tissue. So um, you could have ligament sprains. The other thing you could have would be a tendon strain um, where you actually strain the tendon or you could develop and or you could develop tendonitis or a tear of a tendon. And we talked about those three different 
types of tendon injuries. You would have, you know, just tendonitis or a strain of the tendon, which means there's an inflammatory process in there. The tendon is inflamed. Um, it also means that uh, the tendon uh, could be not functioning as correctly as it should, sliding and gliding within its uh, sheath. Um, and it's irritating. It's painful. You know, it's painful. There's also chronic tendonitis and there's acute tendonitis. Acute tendonitis would be a recent flare up, you know, in the last two weeks of the shoulder and it'd gradually get better over time with loading and proper um, uh, rehabilitation or care and training. Um, and then there would be a tendonitis that's just kind of always there. You know, it aches and hurts when you're not moving around. And then when you go to load it at first, it hurts and then it gets better as you move through the session and then afterwards when you cool down again oh, it's stiff and painful again that it shows us and exhibits to us that there are some adaptive changes in the tendon over time and the tendon is just not as conducive to um, loading and not hurting so you could have chronic tendonitis too that we treat those two um, conditions fairly similar with some differences along the way and how we treat them. And there's, we'll talk about that in our next episode on treatments and, and, uh, and rehab and training for these conditions. So, um, you could have a tendonitis. Tendonitis is probably the most common of injuries. You know, uh, I see more tendonitis and strains and sprains of the shoulder than I do anything else of the shoulder. That's probably the most, the most common injury. And included in that would be things like tendonitis of the rotator cuff, um, the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus normally are the most indicated because they're the most upper and they get the most damage to them um, and uh, generally the most active. But also within that diagnosis could be syndromes and they're kind of like garbage can terms. One of them would be called impingement syndrome. And impingement syndrome is where there is a squeezing or compression of these tendons between the humeral head where they attach and the undersurface of the acromion, the subacromial space. Now, it's important for people to realize that the margin for space in the shoulder is at a premium. It's like living in a, in a high rise condo in New York. It's very expensive and there's not a lot of space available. Right. It's the same with the shoulder and as shoulders get older, what happens is all of these tissues lay right on top of each other in an area called the rotator cuff interval. And they all kind of lay on top of each other. So you've got the bone, and then you've got the tendon attaching to the bone. And then you have a little sheath lining over it. And then you have the bursa. And then you have the bicep tendon that comes right through there. And so, and then you have the undersurface of the acromion. So they're all kind of squeezed in together like a hamburger, a sandwich. And so when one gets thickened or inflamed, they all kind of get pissed off or thickened or inflamed. And then you get a condition in the area of an inflammatory condition. You get thickening of the bursa. That causes impingement. And that's kind of something that doesn't go away for a while. Sometimes it has to be cleaned out with surgery. Sometimes we can treat it with physical therapy and rehab, uh, barbell training and, and um, exercise. Um, and sometimes oral anti-inflammatories help that. Also nutrition and supplements can help that too. But, but impingement syndrome is probably, if not the most common diagnosis in shoulders that, were, that are referred into our clinics, but one of the top two at least. Sure, sure. And would you say, are there, are there genetic variations in the amount of space in that AC joint that, that can determine, you know, are some people... Not the AC joint, but the acromioclavicular. I mean, the um, uh, subacromial the space. The subacromial space, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, in other words, yeah. are, there, are there some people who are more predisposed to injuries of the shoulder than others because of their At bony anatomy? Right, yeah. bony anatomy prim primarily, they're, they're, and posture too uh, serves a big role in that. But, but um, with bony anatomy, if the acromion, the roof of the joint, is crooked down, there's type 1, type 2, type 3 acromiums. Um, uh, the, the angle of downward inclination of that acromion basically just brings the roof closer to the top of the joint. And, um, and brings the surface down, brings that space down. So people um, with a type 2 and type 3 acromion are much more often going to have an impingement problem than people with type 1. And over time, the acromion can actually, the bone can actually hypertrophy and can thicken, and you can develop, you know, an increased calcium buildup underneath there. There's a bunch of conditions. But those are time conditions. It's not an acute injury. Right. Um, but you may notice it one day and go, what happened? I never had any pain before. But it might have been building up for years, you know, of, of use. Yeah, you know, you, you, you think about um, pitchers in the major leagues, you know, where they're throwing at extremely high velocities and often – 
And it's interesting how some guys, you know, and, and there's there's a lot of factors at play, obviously, but there's there's some guys who uh, who have a rubber band for an arm, you know, and they can throw for years and years and years. And there's others who uh, have a pretty short career. Yeah, yeah, you know? and it's a lot of that's you know human genetics, anatomy, training, uh, volume. There's so it's multivariate. There's so many factors. Right. Um, sure. Sure. But um, when we're talking about um, you know, we've, we've already kind of covered muscle strains and ligamentous sprains, and we've talked about tendonitis as both chronic and acute. Um, we do rehab, treat those a little bit differently, like I said, but, but very similar protocols there from both a resistive training model and also um, actual other treatment forms. But then we would talk about actual tendon tears, um, which goes into that tendinopathy category of those three uh, grades of tendon involvement. And when we talk about tendon tears, we talk about a, a grade one tear, a grade two tear, a grade three, and then a full rupture. Um, many times, if it's a grade one or a grade two, that can be um, treated or and or rehabbed or trained, however you want to say it, um, using um, resistive strength training and appropriate techniques to thicken and strengthen that tendon. But there is a protective period there for, for roughly about four to six weeks where we're going to be careful about how we load it because the tendon does weaken immediately after the injury. So we want to, we want to be careful about how we load that there with a progressive loading pattern over the next four to six weeks. But, and when we're talking about a grade three, where at least uh, 50 to 75%. So, so when we talk about uh, tears, we would talk about grade one, zero to 25% of the fibers are torn. Grade two, 25 to 50. Grade three, uh, 50 to 75. And grade four would be a full rupture. Um, the, the fibers are completely torn yeah. um, or there's a remnant of the fibers left. And so think about that as a rope. If you took a rope and you cut, you know, a quarter of it, a half of it, two thirds of it, or three quarters of it, and then you cut it in half. And it's a very similar um, uh, I guess you would say, um, uh, measurement system. So. Yeah. And so when you get to grade three, are you pretty much resigned to surgery at that point or? Well, it just matters what tendon it is, you know, if it's a, um, it varies, you know, um, if it's one of the lower cuff tendons, like, you know, Terry's or the, um, uh, you know, or the, uh, and well, not this necessarily the subscapularis because that's more anterior. Um, but if it, it really matters which tendon it is, okay. and it matters what that tendon's role is in regards to shoulder function and mechanics. Um, the long head of the biceps is a great example. Um, commonly torn tendon. The short head is very seldomly torn. The torn. The long head goes up into the superior portion of the glenohumeral joint. Um, and attaches onto the labrum and the joint, the edge of the fossa there. Um, and the short head goes to the core cord process. But the long head is commonly torn. It acts as a elbow flexor and then also a shoulder flexor. So it's an important two joint muscle, very important. Um, if that tendon is torn at a grade three, they probably would then uh, an attack, they would go in and do an arthroscopy of the joint go in and cut that tendon off where it is and do a tenodesis to it where they bring it down and they attach it um, in the uh, groove, the sulcus of the, uh, the, the humerus. Um, and so now, unfortunately, they can still use their long head of the biceps, which is the lateral head. It's a two joint, I mean, a two head muscle, the medial and lateral head or the, sh the, the short and the long head of the biceps. But what happens is it loses its function as a shoulder flexor. And I also believe, and the literature doesn't bear this out yet, and I, I've, been, I've been reading a lot of literature on it recently to figure this out, that the long hand of the biceps may act as this downward sling or compressor similar to um, and the, uh, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus of the shoulder. They work in a coupling motion. And so when you tear the long head of the biceps and you tenodice it, my experience professionally has been um, that that patient is more um, apt to impinge if they don't have a significant acromioplasty done where they shave the bottom of the roof off 
um, quite a bit. And you got to be careful how much you shave because it is, it's an attachment site for the purchase of the deltoid and the attachment of the clavicle. And so there's a lot of mechanical issues there, but the long hand's really important. And so in a case like that, they would tenodice it. If it's the supraspinatus, the cuff musculature, one of the cuff muscles, rotator cuff, then they're probably, with a grade three, they're going to go in and repair it. Um, with a grade two, they're probably going to w- do a wait and see method. But I will tell you this, there's some literature now and some clinical protocols out there that are basically showing that not repairing the supraspinatus might be just as good as repairing the supraspinatus in regards to function. Now, I get it. You know, we, we have that rolling around in the literature right now. My per, my professional and personal experience has been when the supraspinatus is torn um, and you have a fairly strong deltoid and the cuff has become deficient and you have the wrong architecture of the acromion, you're probably going to impinge. You need to go ahead and have it repaired and have an acromioplasty done and a bursectomy. You need to clean out all the junk in there. Like I said earlier, there's a very small margin of space in there and any thickening or damage or hypertrophic tissue or, or thickening of the, I've seen acromions on the bottom surface that have been so um, rubbed and um, uh, compressed that they've got these stalactites and osteophytes. They've got these bony processes and calcific um, overgrowth and it's hypertrophic. It just, it's unhealthy tissue. It has to be shaved out. Sure. So. Sure. So yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, that uh, tenodesis. Is that something that you've had performed on your, so you've had shoulder surgery recently, right? Yeah. I had a left shoulder um, four anchor cuff repair. So I took four anchors and repaired my supraspinatus and part of my infraspinatus. They did an acromioplasty on me where they shaved the undersurface of the acromion. And I had about a grade one to two um, longitudinal tear of the long head of the biceps. So the the doctor and I chose not to do anything with it, but just to kind of clean up the tendon and leave it. Now, I will tell you, the pain that I have generated in the joint now, and I do have some dysfunction and movement still, even though, you know, I peered my press at nationals, but but, um, the pain I think I have now is not coming from my cuff or my bursa. It's coming from the long head. I think the long head is just kind of unhealthy. Yeah. The tendon where it goes over, where it dives over the top of the, the humerus, and it just it just hurts when you have tears in them sometimes like that mechanically. And so um, I try to strengthen it. I, I, I can't bench anymore, but I can do a dumbbell bench and I can do shoulder press and everything else. But I try to strengthen it and thicken that tendon as best possible and make it healthy. So my general rule of thumb is grade one, grade two tear. We're going to rehab it and strengthen it. Um, grade three, grade four, based on the age of the individual. And I will tell you this, that the older the individual, the less likely they're going to repair it because they look at function and what you need to do with this arm. Um, so when I say older, over 40, you know, you need to be fairly active. But I mean, I've had clients that come in with no cuff with the torn supraspinatus and infraspinatus, at least completely torn. And they have reasonably normal overhead function. Yeah. Now yeah. they, do, they have a, a, a lower activity level in their lifestyle, but they've reasonably been normal function. So, yeah. yeah. And th- so that's, uh, that's another thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, for people that, uh, have, that do have a tear that's been diagnosed and they're getting advice from their, their physician on, you know, the, the likelihood of a surgery improving function after the fact, how much do they need to temper the research that's out there in the medical literature with the fact that we know if you strengthen the shoulder girdle in general, strengthen the muscles around the sure. shoulder, then you can sure. have a healthy amount of function. Right. Yeah, I think I think that's all based on the diagnosis and the function, the clinical exam and the function that's exhibited by the, the patient or the, the client, the trainee. So if I get someone that comes in and six months ago, they heard a pop in their shoulder and now they had limited overhead function actively. And when I measure it passively, there's also some adaptive shortening of the capsule and the joint has limited range of motion and they have weakness. Yeah, you know, I want to see what their diagnostics are. If the diagnostics don't show a cuff tear, then I'd probably try to strengthen that person, improve the passive mobility through some, some manual therapy techniques that we do to stretch the shoulder joint and see if I can get the shoulder stronger with more normal function. Um, But if I look at their diagnostics and it shows a full 
thickness cuff tear, like the cuff tear is completely, it's just ruptured off the bone. And they have all these same symptoms and signs, and it's six months old, or it's three months old, or it's one month old. Um, if they're not a much, much, much older individual with very little need for overhead shoulder function, um, I'm probably going to recommend to that individual that they just go ahead and have it repaired. Sure. Um, but I see the large majority of my clients with grade one to grade three and grade two, some, some grade three tears of, of different cuff muscles that we try a prehab setting first, a rehab, because if nothing else, as long as we're not producing a lot of pain and a lot more damage to the, the humerus, the undersurface of the chromium or the surrounding tissues, and I can get them stronger before th- surgery, rock and roll. You know, it just makes sense to do that. Yeah, at the very um, least, it would aid in recovery after the surgery. Yeah, right? I mean, I, I had a full thickness cuff tear with four anchor repair, and I was pressing in the 170s and 180s um, for triples before I had surgery. There were some things that I just couldn't do anymore. Right. And the reason why I had surgery was because, you know, holding my bow was almost impossible. Holding my, my archery bow up without a weird shoulder position. Things like that that were just harder. Now... In hindsight, I will say this, that probably a lot of my pain was coming from my bicep too. And uh, I didn't have the bicep repaired. So, and I, I, I would have, I am glad I made that decision and did not have a tenodesis because at least my bicep still serves as a um, shoulder flexor to some extent. And maybe like we talked about a um, uh, compressor and inferior glide accessory muscle tendon to help with shoulder function overhead. So. Yeah, you know, I think we'll have to revisit um, in an, in another podcast the uh, role of the bicep tendon in. Um, yeah, I've got about in, ten studies that I've read, <laughs> that I've started to read, and and I, I just can't. You know, there's no consensus in the literature. A lot of surgeons and even you know, like anatomists and biomechanics guys and ladies, they they don't they don't they won't say with a, a strong amount of certainty that the bicep assist the cuff musculature. But I, 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 you know, mechanically, I can't see how it doesn't. Right. Um, when you look at how it is designed and how it comes over the top of the humerus, it looks like its pull would naturally, once the cuff fires, um, couple with the cuff right. in an agonist motion to help the downward depression and uh, compression of the um humorous in the glenoid. So, well, it's interesting, you know, you were demonstrating to me the other day, um, kind of off mic that if you try to raise your arms in front of you with some resistance. So if I was pushing down on your hands as you had them outstretched and trying to raise them upwards, you could not keep your left shoulder right. from raising. Right. 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 At which, which you can see how that could cause impingement on the bench press. As you mentioned, that's why you don't bench Yeah, is because it's, it's so difficult without that without good purchase of that bicep tendon to really be able to pull your shoulders back and yeah, keep I think them from it, impinging. I think it's probably a couple of things. It's probably, you know, the deltoid, uh, your arm senses that it's not getting good downward depression. So your deltoid and your upper traps fire a little earlier or your upper trap fires a little earlier, a little stronger with more resistance, more strength um, to, cause it senses your body senses that it needs to pull that scapular fossa more vertical or more superior. But you know, some of that's pain induced too. So I, yeah, I don't, it's, it's a complex shoulder is extremely complex joint. But I think when we talk about these tears, it's important to understand that just because you have a tear of a cuff musculature or bicep mus- musculature doesn't mean that you can't continue to strength train at some level. Um, the, it, each person uh, is a different case and those things need to be discussed between you your strength coach and your physical therapist or surgeon um, and then come up with a consensus of what they've seen work and th- this is what I've seen work nine out of ten people that walk into my office that have a shoulder tear of some type um, as long as it is not um, as long as it is a grade two or less and some grade threes and fours based on age, and need of use, I'm going to rehab them. I'm going to start training them. Now, I have to be careful how I load that tendon based on the, the, um, the freshness, how, how, how long ago they tore that tendon. If they felt a pop on Monday and it's Wednesday and they have significantly limited overhead shoulder function, we're going to be real careful. First of all, we're going to, probably going to get an MRI of the joint. 
um, so that we can see, or an orthogram, we can see what's going on. Right. Um, and then we can develop a rehab program that best meets that person's needs. But no matter what, at some point, even prior to surgery, strength training is going to be part of that process. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, so we talked about tendon tears. We talked about the rotator cuff, the bicep. Sometimes the tricep can be torn too. Um, it's less frequently torn than the bicep or the cuff too. But let's talk about dislocations or subluxations of the shoulder joint. Um, sometimes people will get injuries where they'll fall on the arm or um, they'll have something fall on the shoulder and they will sublux, meaning it is just there's a partial movement of the, hu- of the head out of the socket over the edge of the joint. And it may stretch, overstretch the ligaments, but not really tear them so significantly. Or there could be a full dislocation where the, the ball comes completely out of the socket and is sitting outside the socket and stuck there. Sometimes it will self um, relocate, or sometimes they have to have a physician or an EMT or someone in an emergent sense relocate that arm, uh, sometimes under anesthesia that has to be done or with a local sedation. And so um, in situations like that, where there's a dislocation, there might be cartilage damage, um, there might be some tendon tearing, uh, there's definitely some capsular uh, damage, some ligamentous damage. And with that person, especially with an older client, our number one job is to not get them back to strength training really quickly and full range of motion. We've got to allow that capsule to scar back down, or we could cause a situation where they have chronic laxity. And they end up um, uh, having a, a permanently lax, unstable shoulder joint, whatever direction it dislocated, anterior, posterior, inferior, anterior, inferior. Those are the most common. Superior is very uncommon. You have to fracture the, the um, acromium off pretty much to do that. But, but anterior, inferior, and posterior, inferior, the, and posterior most common. Um, so with that person, there's an immobilization period where we immobilize that shoulder to ensure that um, we're allowing that capsule, wherever it was torn, to kind of scar back down because we want it to tighten up. It's right. highly likely you're, they're going to develop a little bit of laxity. Yeah. And so yeah. once we lose that, that, that underlying passive stability that's created just by the ligament structures themselves, then no amount of muscular strength can um, offset that inert passive instability, um, and it can be a problem long term. So we're careful with that. Yeah, so anecdotally, I knew a, a few guys when I played football uh, in high school that dislocated shoulder yeah, sure, sure. And, the, and it happened multiple times through their football career. Yeah, they become hyperlax and they, be, they develop laxity long term and they're not going to fix that. And in that sense, sometimes they go and they do a capsular repair or a capsular raffi and they, they strap or sling the, usually it's anterior or inferior, and they sling that joint, strap it and um, move some muscle tendons around and, and basically create, create a strapping effect. Try to create some tightness. Yeah. Again, yeah. Uh, they, they re-tighten the capsule and then create another tightening um, structure over the top of the capsule too, anatomically. But, but yeah, with kids, it's, you know, with kids and adults, it's really important. Um, um, kids, if you're not careful, they can become chronically lax pretty quickly. Um, because they can get back to sport pretty fast and they hurt less and they can get the shoulder moving and, and that's a problem. Adults, it hurts like a mother and um, you're probably not going to want to move the joint for three or four weeks anyway. Right. So there is a period of protective immobilization where we have to observe and that's generally for uh, progressional protective immobilization for somewhere around four to eight weeks based on the severity of the, the ligament, I mean the dislocation and the tear of tissue. Um, also, nerve injuries can occur then where you can get palsies of nerves. There's nerve injuries to the, the suprascapular nerve, infrascapular nerve, um, uh, musculocutaneous. These are all nerves that feed the shoulder joint, the axillary nerve that feeds the deltoid. Um, if you have nerve injuries, then we treat those differently too. Um, and that could have come through an overstretch injury, like a stinger, you know, where a guy yeah. gets, you know, uh, pushed, his head gets pushed one direction, shoulder goes down and, and, um, uh, you get a stinger, you get an overstretch of the brachial plexus, um, or some of those tissues. And so nerve injuries or other injuries that it could occur. We, we, we see those much more seldomly than we do the classical muscle strains and ligamentous sprains and then tendon. Uh, tears or ten, tendonitis type conditions and impingement syndrome. Those are the top diagnosis that we see. Those four uh, t- diagnoses are really the, the main ones. Um, and, and then the last thing is that we can't for, forget like 
bursitis issues. Um, some people will get bursitis and, um, um, and basically bursitis is, is pretty much concomitant with, or consistent with two, probably some adaptive changes underneath that acromion over the top of the ball of the joint of the shoulder right. lays a big bursal pad and it sits in between um, the humerus, humeral head, and the undersurface of the acromion, okay, the roof of the joint. And through rubbing and rubbing and over time, that, that bursa can become chronically inflamed or acutely inflamed, and it swells. Well, underneath that are the rotator cuff tendons, and then the bicep tendon comes through there too. And so, and then you've got the undersurface of the acromion, which can be painful too if you wear the cartilage off of it, um, and you have bone exposed. And so when you look at all these things, you've got, you've got everything's crowded together there in that interval of space. And so if the, the, burs, the bursa is inflamed and you've got bursitis, and by the way, guys, if you put the word itis at the end of any word, it basically is just a kind of a Latin uh, way to say infl inflammation. So if you say bursitis, inflammation of the bursitis. I got the itis. Bursitis. Yep. If you say uh, myositis, inflammation of the muscle. Um, if you say osteitis, inflammation of the bone. So dermatitis, inflammation of the skin. So, so anytime you hear that, it's just inflamed. Um, so when the bursa gets inflamed, it can also become thickened and it actually hypertrophies, it swells and it doesn't go back to its original size. Now, again, we have that crowding and usually when they have an impingement syndrome type patient where there's all that crowding, they will go in, they'll first inject it with a corticosteroid and see if that'll shrink it. And that's kind of, yeah, that's approach avoidance because sometimes that steroid also is very hard on good healthy tissue or tendons that are already torn. It can damage the matrix, the strength of the tendons. And so we have to be careful with how many injections, corticosteroid injections you have, but it can shrink it down. But eventually what they have to do sometimes is just go in and they do a scope and they just cut all that old bursa out and all that thickened synovial tissue. They clean up the roof of the joint. They create space basically for everything to work right. The rotator cuff might be fine. And then what, guess what happens? The body just regrows a new bursa. It knows to regrow new bursa there. So, you you know, it grows it back. So, um, and usually patients do real well with that. So, um, that's another thing that can happen, bursitis. So, when we go through this long laundry list of pathologies in the shoulder joint, we would take it from strains of the muscle, sprains of the ligament, and strains of the tendon and tears of the tendon, inflammatory conditions of the tendon, both chronic and acute, and then also it, we threw in there that different the different tendon grades of damage. Uh, we talked about tendonitis, tendinosis, and tendinopathy, differing grades of damage over time, more permanent damage too. And then we talk about some arthritic conditions where um, the shoulder cartilage has been worn and it is exposed to the subchondral bone, and that becomes very painful. So an arthritic shoulder um, also causes pain, which causes muscular weakness and atrophy, which can cause less mobility. And that's that stiff old shoulder that just doesn't want to move. And the best thing we can do for that shoulder is try to move it. Um, sometimes with the rubber meets the road, we come to a fork in the road where we've, we've loaded the joint and moved the joint as much as it can tolerate based on its health. It's joint, joint health. And then sometimes surgery is the only path there in some cases, or recognizing that that could be a limiting factor right there. That's right. Yeah. And so we're going to get to that more in the next episode when we talk about rehab and sure. you know, specific exercise. things you can do, uh, specific exercise modalities, modalities you can use. Sure. Um, but yeah, you know, there's certainly, we know a lot of uh, master's trainees that, that choose like, you know what, we just don't need to bench press. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, if they limit, if they have limited overhead range of motion, we might say, Hey, let's split the difference. Let's see if we can use like an incline press. Yeah. Um, so there's ways we can certainly modify, um, Sure. you know, short of surgery. And then, you know, in some cases, yeah, it is necessary. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are cases where, I mean, you see all these magical programs and miracle cures and stuff, but the reality is, is that there are cases in which the shoulder joint health has um, de deteriorated so much or to a certain level where, where certain types of function are limited. They're just limited. Right. Um, I, I think the classical shoulder that we see in our client base and in our gym trainee population in the 40 plus individual is the person who has developed some tightness in the shoulder, 
Um, generally, laxity is not a problem unless they have a dislocation history um, or they're a naturally very hypermobile, uh, flexible individual, and that's genetic. Um, but they have a tight shoulder and maybe they have some wear and tear in the shoulder and that's caused some atrophy and some weakness and some lack of quality biomechanics or movement because they've developed kind of adaptive mood movement pattern over time. So my theory and my practical uh, experience here is that I don't wait for them to get good mobility back to load them and do activities. I load them with the existing range of motion that they have. And then along the way, work on more range of motion. I load them in the healthy range of motion that they have and then work on more range of motion through the exercise activities themselves that we're doing. And through then through also, if it's clinically needed, um, stretching manual therapy techniques that I do to the shoulder, whether it be mobilization, stretching the capsule, or actually manipulating the capsule or manipulating the joint. Um, and so, but that's, that's that classic patient. And some of those patients have some arthritis in the joint, um, which means Arth means Latin, in Latin means joint and itis inflammation again. So they just have some inflammation in the joint. They have some worn tendons and they have some thickening of the tissue. And But we need to see what we can do. Right. And my, right. my philosophy always is intervene with rehab and training first with most cases, unless it's a severe, severe rupture or tear that has to be repaired for you to have function or be able to, you know, some tendon tears are so bad that if you don't reattach them, then it kills the blood supply to the muscle and the tendon or to the tendon and it dies and you can't repair it right. or it retracts so far. So it has to be repaired. And that's your surgeon's job to make that decision, not mine as a therapist. But then from there, everyone will go into a strengthening rehab training program with corrective exercises and strengthening exercises and then see what we've got to work with. Sure. Yeah. I mean, let's be real. How many of your patients when they first come to you have an adequately strong shoulder? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say 40 plus. Um, it's probably 50 50. I mean, most guys um, have developed some weakness if they don't have um, a lifestyle where they actively lift overhead and they strengthen. And definitely if they have a desk job or if they have like a computer job where they sit a lot and their upper body is significantly weak. So, um, hundred uh, percent of the people that we treat and train could get stronger period. Yeah. Sure, so, sure. So basically guys, today we covered, um, some of the major pathologies of the shoulder. We really haven't covered the specifics about how to treat those because, you know, to do that, we'd have to take a podcast for every major disorder, basically for, you know, rotator cuff injuries. How do we treat those for, um, dislocations? How do we treat those? Cause there are protocols that I follow, um, from diagnosis to diagnosis, similar, um, there are some similarities between protocols, but there are some differences along the way that we have to observe to ensure that we get a good outcome. But what we're going to cover next episode is we're going to cover some of the basic concepts that we use to not only rehab shoulders from a clinical sense, but also to strengthen them in a training setting where you're not working with a medical professional like a DPT or a physician or something like that. So we're going to talk about some of the exercises that we do. Some of those exercises are very similar from um, environment to environment. And uh, we're going to go over those things. We're going to talk about some of the modifications that we use. And um, then hopefully that'll help you if you've got some shoulder challenges and you're trying to get stronger to improve your quality of life. So thanks for joining us today on the 40 Fit Radio. And thanks for joining the 40 Fit Nation. Listen to the next podcast that we're going to have, which is going to be on shoulder intervention exercises. And uh, I think that's going to be a great one. Uh, if you want to check us out on the interwebs, you can go to 40fit.com and you can find us there. We have a tab on the top of the page which says 40 Fit Radio. You can click on that. You can also go to info at 40fit.com if you want to email us. You can go to Instagram and we are at 40 Fit Radio, the number four zero, then Fit Radio. You can contact Trent directly at Marmalade Cream and you can contact me directly at DL Deaton. And or you can go to Facebook community group, which is the 40 Fit Masters community group, and you can check us out there. Make sure you share our podcast, give us reviews, and comment on our Instagram post. Uh, we're more active on Instagram than we are on Facebook right now. We're still trying to figure out how to use that whole Facebook thing, what, what we're going to do with that. You know, it's only but, been out for like 
15 years at this point. It's <laughs> <laughs> no, but I just like Instagram so much better. I hate to admit I it. It's so I simple, too. so much more simple, but let's face it. A lot of our 40 plus folks are on Facebook more than they are Instagram, but That's get right. you an Instagram handle and, and uh, like us on Instagram and friend us wherever, whatever you do on that. And just, just be a part of our community there too. If you have questions, always put comments and questions down underneath the posts and we will definitely answer those within 24 hours and get back with you uh, to try to help you in your training because that's our goal. So thanks for joining us today and have a great day. Thank you.